Well, about 50 uh, Sunday mornings a year, I preach here or somewhere else. I love preaching, but once or twice a year, I have a Sunday where I don't preach. Usually when I'm not here, I'm, I'm preaching somewhere, but today I get to be here and I get to sit with my wife in church and I get to sit under the preaching of another pastor. And Gary Thomas, of all the people I could sit and learn from, uh, is one of those people I just I love to learn from. I actually was reading books he had written and, and learned uh, from his ministry years before we met each other and reached out to him at a conference we were going to both be at and said, will you please be my friend? No, I, I just I said, can we hang out and have lunch? And God has kind of bound a friendship together between he and Lisa and Sherry and I that's now uh, 15, 16, 17 years old, and so we're thankful for that. Um, Gary is going to wrap up our series on the dream life. And what we've been looking at is this idea of there's kind of things outward things that the Bible's clear there's things to be done with and new things to walk into and step into in God's power, how that transforms our lives. And, and Gary has uh, picked a topic of transformation that I think is challenging and we don't hear preached on a lot and, and one that is necessary. And so Gary, thank you for your faithfulness to do that. I wanna pray for him that God would anoint him with his Holy Spirit, bring exactly the words we need to hear and let's pray for ourselves that our hearts are open and our lives are ready. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for Gary and Lisa. Lord, we, could, we celebrate the, 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 the books that he's written and the ministry that they've done and the lives that they've touched. But today, we pray for this moment. We're gathered together as your people online and on campus, and we're hungry to learn from your word. And so, Spirit of God, anoint Gary's heart, his lips, fill him with your power, and open our hearts and our ears and, and, and our, let us be willing to be transformed by your word. We pray that we would step more into the life you have for us, the dream life you have for us, because we've been together learning from your word in this minute. We're ready to receive, Lord Jesus. Speak to our hearts, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. Well, Lisa and I are just so thrilled to be here. We love it when we come here. You know, I'm sure you know. This really is one of the most beautiful places in the country. Just in a few days we've been here, we've been out past Lover's Point twice, one biking, another one walking, enjoying downtown Carmel, all the things that tourists kind of do. But I gotta tell you, when you can enjoy this place without paying California taxes, or $5.50 for one gallon of gas, it really is a lot of fun, so we're thrilled to be here. But even more beautiful than the coastline here is really just the, the people and the leadership here. I don't know if you realize the international impact that Shoreline and the leadership has. And so it is such an honor for us to be here. I don't know how many times it's been through the years, but one time that really sticks out in my mind was when my son was still with us. And Kevin lined up, because Graham golfs, an opportunity to play at Tehama, Clint Eastwood's private golf club and it was incredible and I love that it's got the coolness of Clint Eastwood the club championship trophy is a pistol which I thought was was kind of cool and so I'm peppering the, the the member that had brought us in and got us in with all of these stories it told me the account of a woman who was at a club function and she'd had a little too much to drink that was strike one and she thought in her inebriated state, everybody would be fascinated about her opinions about everything. That was strike two. And then she thought in particular that Clint Eastwood would be enthralled by her critique of Tehama Golf Club and how other golf clubs compare more favorably to her experience here because she's a member of other clubs. Now, that's strike three. I mean, she, she was talking to Clint Make my day, Eastwood. She was talking to Clint, do you feel lucky, punk? Do you, Eastwood? But the, the member said, look, Clint was gracious. He was patient. He was just everything you might hope he would be. But when she was done, he calls over the business manager and he gives him a number. He says, I want you to write out a check for this. It was her membership fee. He says, thank you. We'll take that under advisement. Here's your membership fee. You're no longer a member of the club. <laughs> I never heard what her husband said when he found out that she, her judgment had gotten them kicked out of one of the most exclusive golf clubs in the nation. But what we're going to talk about today is that Jesus says our judgment of people will cost us more than a golf membership. It will cost us God's favor. It will conflict with the way that we view ourselves. It will get in the way of our testimony. So what we need to understand, what Jesus is going to lead us through in his words, is that our judgment of other people is just as offensive to God 
as an inebriated woman's judgment of Clint Eastwood's golf club was to Clint. We look at what she's, what was she thinking? And yet I think the angels watch us judging and say, what are they thinking? Jesus is going to lead us into a whole new reality, a whole new understanding of how we view God and ourselves and others. Uh, we're wrapping up, as Kevin said, the series called The Dream Life. Uh, Kevin has gone through a number of them. He's talked about being out with anger and in with peace, out with bitterness, in with compassion. That was a particularly hard-hitting one. Out with the wasted life and in with the strategic life. As Lisa and I listened to these, we found them to be transformative. And I, I want to urge those of you who are watching online, if you missed those, please go back. I found one sermon a week often isn't enough. These are transformative sermons that invite you to a whole new way of living and just looking at life. And what I want to do this morning is, is talk about something that Jesus said would be transformative. That is out with toxic judgment and in with wise discernment. We'll begin by looking at Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 through 5 when Jesus says this. Do not judge or you too will be judged. We're just going to roll through these. Thank you. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. Now let me pause it because a lot of times you just read scripture and you don't change your tone. You don't change your thought. The words here tell us how Jesus was talking. You don't just say, you know what, you're kind of a hypocrite. He said, you hypocrite. He just said, this is what you do. He goes, that's being a hypocrite. He says, take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. This may be the most quoted scripture in all of the Bible. Almost everybody in the world seems to know it, and they love to throw it in the face of Christians, and Christians love to throw it in the face of each other. But the challenge is, it's one of the least observed verses in all this. We all know it, and we all break it, because here's the funny thing about it. If you challenge somebody saying, judge not, lest you be not judged, you're breaking the verse. You're making a judgment. You're saying you're judging and you shouldn't be judging. You're doing exactly what Jesus says not to do. So maybe instead of quoting the verse at each other, we receive it and we learn how to apply it. But it's not easy. It's just what we do. It may be the most difficult of all of Jesus' commands to apply. Fish like to swim Birds fly, dogs bark, and people judge. We do. It's just, it just feels like part of being human. I don't know if this was 18 months ago. It was two years ago. I don't know. Is it in the height of the COVID madness? I was taking a walk, and I saw a woman pass me. She was driving in a car by herself, and she was wearing a mask. I knew all about her at that point. That told me I, I know so many of her opinions. I could kind of tell what kind of cars you're driving, where, where she felt like with, with fear. And I thought, oh, come on. Like, you're going to give COVID to yourself? I mean, I was feeling quite superior to her. I, I just can't believe she's wearing a mask in a car by herself. A week later, I had to go pick up a prescription at a pharmacy. I did. I came out of the pharmacy, and I got in my car, and I pulled away. That's maybe a block or two from the store. When a guy saw me through the windshield, I saw him point at me and laugh with the other people in the car. I, what, what? I'd forgotten to take off my mask, which you had to wear in the pharmacy. And he knew all about all of my opinions. He knew probably what kind of car I drove. And he thought, what in it? Does he think he's going to give COVID to himself? I mean, I'm sure he felt so superior to me. It's really hard not to judge. And yet Jesus says, if we want the dream life, we can't do it. Verse one, do not judge. And he tells us why, so that you will be not be judged. Now, 
to understand this, let's, let's take a step back. When Jesus says, do not judge, I want to make the case he is not saying suspend all judgment altogether. I'm looking at the context and I'll make that case. He's addressing the way we judge and why we judge, not whether we judge. How can you say that, Gary? Well, in verse six, which is five verses later, Jesus says, don't give what is holy to dogs. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Well, you can't Make that opinion without making a judgment. Is this a dog? Is this a pig? I shouldn't give my food. I shouldn't give my pearls to them. It requires a judgment. In verse 15 of this same chapter, the same sermon, he warns us about false prophets. How do you know if somebody's a false prophet without making a judgment? And then in the gospel of John, we see that Jesus says this very clearly. John chapter 7, verse 24. He says, stop judging by mere appearances but instead judge correctly. So Jesus is attacking a particular kind of judgmental attitude, not just the act of judgment. He's calling us to wise discernment instead of toxic judgment. Because we know this is from language. The same words can mean different things in different contexts. And that's what Jesus is dealing with here. Let's say I was walking at 2 a.m. in the wholesale district of L.A. Some of you know, me being a tourist, you say, Gary, why are you walking in the wholesale district of L.A. at 2 a.m.? To which I say, don't judge, all right? You got to wait to the end of the sermon. You won't say it. Well, let's just say I am. And some guy comes up to me. He pulls out a knife and he says, give me your money or I'm going to start cutting. I'm going to have a certain kind of reaction. But let's say I'm at the UCLA Medical Center in the operating room. And a jovial surgeon walks in and says, well, the business office tells me you've paid us your money. I can start cutting now. And everybody laughs and I laugh. Why? It's an entirely different situation. Same words, cutting and money. But they mean two entirely different things because one is to heal, the other is to hurt. And that's the way that Jesus is dealing with this. When judging is about healing out of concern, It's actually healthy. It's setting someone right in a gentle and godly way. But when it's about condemning or ridiculing or making ourselves feel better and you do it just because you're a mean person, that's destructive. That's what's wrong. And that's what Jesus is calling us away from. So Jesus would say this, God's people are here to heal, not to hurt. In the dream life, this has to be true of literally every relationship we should have with anybody on this planet. Our goal should be be to bring healing, never hurt. In other words, we are spiritual surgeons, not assassins. Those are two different names. You have a knife, it's your tongue, and it's your brain, and it's your thoughts. Are you using that knife to be a surgeon or an assassin? Jesus is pointing us toward being a surgeon. And we can't completely ignore judging. In, Luke, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus gives us instructions for how we treat somebody who has sinned. You can't do that if you're not judging whether they've sinned. And Paul deals with this explicitly in Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. When he says, brothers and sisters, if, if someone's caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should... Ignore it. Don't bring it up because it's kind of an awkward situation. Just pretend it never happened so that, you know, in the end we'll all be okay. That's not what Paul says. He says we restore that person, what's that next word? Gently. And then watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. So Paul says we're going to have to make a judgment. Two things should dominate what we do. Gentleness to lead to healing and humility. We're not all of that. We're not the judge of everybody. With humility, we watch ourselves. John Stott puts this together in a brilliant way as he is wont to do. The command to judge not is not a requirement to be blind. It's rather a plea to be generous. 
So how do we know which is which? Is this a good judging? Is this a bad judging? Well, since the Greek word for judge, it's krino in Greek, is, can be used in different ways, we have to look at another word that will help us understand what Jesus is saying that it, it means. That other word is found in verse 3. It's, it's katanoeto. When Jesus says, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? That word look, why do you look, is why do you katanoeto? Katanoeto. That's what we have to understand. He said, why, why do you katanoeto? He basically says, don't go to katanoeto. In this context, katanoeto isn't just observing somebody sinning. It's looking down upon them. It's judgmental. It's pondering in a negative way. It's almost just like, gotcha. Yay, this is a good day. I, I caught you. And so it's an arrogant attitude, Catanoeto is, that looks at this. He's got these qualities. First, it's a person who is negative. They want to find something bad. It's, it's like, this sounds so messed up, but it's like a surgeon who opens somebody up and she hopes she finds cancer. Or he opens up, he hopes there's a, how, how morbid could you be? But spiritually, that's the kind of person who goes to Kananoeto. They're uncharitable. They're more eager there. They're there to find a sin, to ridicule and condemn somebody than they are to bring healing to that person. They get a lustful pleasure out of discovering others' mistakes or failings. It actually brings joy to them rather than remorse and concern and empathy and compassion. There's this sick pleasure in it. They put the worst possible spin on anyone's book. What is the worst explanation why they said that, what they must mean, what makes it sound so atrocious? That's got to be what they intended. They're trying to make it even worse. But I think most devastatingly of all, Someone who goes to Catanoeto is a stranger to mercy. They're a stranger to mercy. And let me just say, friends, if you're a stranger to mercy, you're a stranger to God. He's not an active part of your life. And that's why Jesus says, don't go to Catanoeto. More than this is a harsh prohibition. These are words birthed in love and concern and compassion because Catanoeto sets us up for spiritual ruin. It sets us up for spiritual ruin. If you live a life of judging others, you're doing more damage to yourself than you are to the person that you're judging. We don't often get that. But you are. If, if you're judging others, you're doing more damage to yourself spiritually than you are to the person you're judging. Now, a lot of us know most sins, we know we're doing damage to ourselves. If we drink too much, we know we're not doing our liver a favor. If we eat too much, we know we're not doing our heart a favor. If we gamble too much, we know we're not doing our bank account a favor. I think most people know if you're looking at porn, you're not doing your brain and your relationships a favor. We know we're doing damage to yourself. The danger of catanoeto so we don't understand how dangerous it is, how debilitating it is. And this is why it is so debilitating. Jesus says, for in the way you judge, this is verse two, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, this is, this is amazing because the day will come when all of us will be judged by who? By Jesus. Jesus is the one who's going to judge us. We know this from John chapter five when we're told this. Moreover, the father judges no one but has entrusted all judgment to the son who is Jesus. Jesus is the one. The day will come, and maybe you're not in the faith and you're watching online, but look, I believe this. It is true. And maybe you will be reminded of this someday if you, if you don't want to deal with it now. Everyone that can hear me will spend some time face to face with Jesus at the end of our life. And Jesus is the only one who will judge us. This is like an umpire before a major league baseball game. If he pulls in the pitchers and the catchers and the coaches and the batters, 
He says, this is a strike zone. I'm going to call this a strike. This is a ball. Here's where the plate is. Here's my zone. I mean, it would make it so much easier because those players often have to spend a few innings figuring out, okay, this is what the guy's calling. This is what he doesn't call. Jesus doesn't make us guess. He says, this is how you will be judged. And what is that standard? The way that you judge others, that's how I'm going to judge you. Now think about this. How many of us feel good about the thought that when I see Jesus face to face, the first thing I should say is, Jesus, I read your words. Exactly how I've treated other sinners and judged other sinners, that's how I want you to judge me. Do any of us say, yes, yes, yeah? Or are we like, oh, <laughs> I need to make a few changes. If that's how I'm gonna be judged, and Jesus says it is, Maybe this verse is a little more important, not to quote it others, but to apply myself. Because what will we want on Judgment Day? We want grace. We want mercy. Our only hope is grace and mercy. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says, there's no one righteous, not even one. It ends, there is no one who does good, not even one. If we wanna play the judging game, it's not about being on a curve. All of us will lose. If you live in constant Catanoetto, if you go to Catanoetto, you are judging others by a standard you yourself will never live up to. Jesus is calling us to the dream life, a whole new existence where it's not about comparing ourselves left or right. It's about living by grace, saved by grace and people who have fallen in love with grace and offer that same grace to others. But see, when we don't live by grace, when we judge others, this is how monstrous it is. When we judge others, we are literally setting ourselves up as God. Now, why do I say that? Jesus says, judging is my job. And so when I step in front of Jesus to judge others, I'm saying, Jesus, I don't know that you got this one, Jesus. I, I think you missed that. I don't think you know their motives like I do. Jesus, I think I can do a better judging this person than you can. Now, it sounds horrendous, but it would be like somebody today, this afternoon, when the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are playing and they jump onto the field and they push Tom Brady out of the way. Yeah, I don't think you got this. I, I think I could play this next series better than you. Why don't you just go sit on the bench and let me take over? Or somebody that was watching Wimbledon at the height of Serena Williams when she was number one in the world and you jump out of the court. Serena, I, I'm not sure you can do this next set. I mean, this is an important set. Why, why don't you let me play for you? I mean, everybody said, what an idiot. How arrogant that you would put aside Tom Brady or Serena Williams. It is a hundred times worse than that to say, Jesus, I don't think you're up to judging. I think I need to put myself in your place. You, you see how offensive that is. So the question is, am I an exception to this? Can I judge? Well, is your name Jesus? Now, I know in Spanish, some are called Jesus. So can you put the Christ after the end of your name, all right? If you can't, no. It's not your job, and it's offensive to God that you would put yourself in the place of Jesus. So if it's so destructive, why do we do it? And this is what I've loved about the way that Kevin has dealt with this series. He's real and he's honest and he's humble and he tries to get to the motives. Why are we angry? Why, why do we waste time? So if we see the danger of judging, I, I've tried to ask myself, well, well, then why do I judge? If there's nothing good to be gained, if it's so toxic to do it, why, why do I do it? And you know, I think the answer is, it makes us feel better about ourselves, but for the wrong reason. See, I know I don't love my wife fully like Christ loves the church. I mean, the Bible tells me to do that, and I aspire toward that. But if you were to judge me, Gary, do you actually 24-7 love your wife like Christ loves you? No. And, and I can be convicted. 
And now I have two places to go, judgment or mercy. I could say, God, have mercy on me. Or I could say, but look, look at how he doesn't love his wife. Look at what he does for his wife he shouldn't do. And, and he doesn't do that for his wife. And I do that for my wife. And I feel better because, well, yeah, I don't love my life, wife like Christ loves you. Who does? But I'm better than that loser. I'm better than that husband. But that doesn't help me grow. It breaks God's heart. It's offensive to God. And it's not where my worth should be. As Christians, our worth isn't measured by how we, on the scale of, you know, God doesn't grade on a curve because we would all fail. Where do I find my worth in the dream life? Where do I find assurance when I know I don't measure up? Where do I find peace when I'm striving and I fail again and again and again? Judging says, well, find somebody who's worse. If you're on the ninth step, find somebody on the second step. You know, it, it, But for a Christian, the dream life, our worth, is being an adopted son or daughter of God. We're adopted children. That's our worth. So our refuge is mercy because the only entrance into being adopted as God's children is through the mercy given us by Jesus Christ who died on the cross, who rose from the dead, offers us his spirit and will forgive us our sins. And so we need to fall in love with mercy. We define ourselves by mercy. And when we do that, we'll become such fans of mercy that we love to see mercy wherever it is. We want to see mercy there. We want to see mercy there. We are enamored with mercy. We're the biggest fans of mercy. We think mercy is miraculous because it is. People who judge, they don't even see the wonder of mercy. They don't cry tears at how good God has been to them. They have darkened hearts from judging others. And then it stops our growth cold. Because see, when I'm trying to feel better about myself, not through mercy, but by comparing myself to others, I, I look at them so intensely to try to make myself feel better about myself that I'm blinded to where I can grow, the work that God does want to do in my life. Now, do, we, do you have anybody here that um, has like small children, like you have toddlers and then a kid that's two or under? Right, yeah, kudos for being here this morning, all right? It's, it's not easy, and, and you know the very fact that you're here. And I remember those days, and I would spend so much energy trying to get the kids ready, their hair brushed, their teeth, no, their hair, yeah, hair combed, teeth brushed. Uh, dress, they had to have the same two shoes on. Sometimes they would get that wrong and you get on the right, I mean, you just, it's so exhausting to try to get to church on time. Sometimes I would sit down in a minivan, which we had way back then, and I'd look in the mirror and say, did I shave? Did I comb my hair? I actually had hair back then to comb. I mean, it's like, I spent so much time trying to get the kids dressed and presentable and ready. I didn't have time to think about myself. And Jesus is saying, that's what happens to us spiritually when I look at my neighbor's sin. And Jesus is saying, you can become a new person. You can become more mature. All of the things that Kevin has talked about, the dream life, you can become that, but you'll never become that. None of those sermons will help you if you try to find refuge in comparing yourself to your neighbor who's worse than to Jesus who's perfect, because you will find things when you look. Jesus says in verse three, hey, there is a speck in your brother's eye. He's not saying your brother is perfect. He's not saying you won't find, he goes, you will find something, but here's the thing. If you compare your sin to your brother's or your sister's, it, th th there's gonna be sin, but compare yourself to me. That's the dream life I'm calling you to, and, and that's a whole different experience. We can focus on how others need to grow. Or we can focus on how we need to grow. And what Jesus is saying the dream life is, is this. Grow your own garden. Don't jump over the fence and weed your neighbors. You got plenty to do in your own garden. And so I have to stop comparing myself with my neighbor and become enamored with Jesus and who he calls me to be, someone who's like him. I mentioned playing it to Hamo with my son here. Um, 
And uh, Graham is a better golfer than me, but I, I have taken lessons through the years and I've worked hard. And Kevin didn't know this until earlier this morning when I mentioned it. After all that work, I finally became a three handicap per hole. A three handicap per hole. So I'm a Roman seven golfer. What I don't want to do, that's what I do. What I want to do, I rarely do. But when I have my best day and Graham has his worst, we can come close. So he beat me at Tehama, but it was only by a few strokes, which was kind of fun. It could actually be competitive because we, you know, he's better than me, but there can be times when it's almost competitive. And then later I had a golf pro friend of mine. He's on the PGA tour says, Gary, Hey, I got a couple tickets for the masters round one. If you want to come, I got tickets waiting for you at Will Call. I said, absolutely, I want to come. But look, I'm married. I know an invitation like this. You got to ask your wife first. And, and my wife is just really not into sports at all. And, and so I said, honey, Jonathan called. I got two tickets to the Masters. She goes, oh, that sounds like fun. Uh, where's the Masters being played this year? <laughs> I said, honey, if you have to ask that question... Where is the Masters being played? You can't appreciate the miracle that these tickets represent. She goes, yeah, maybe you should ask Graham. I said, yeah, I thought that would be a good idea. So I called up Graham. He flew in from his college. We met. And it was just, it was just an unbelievable day, a, a lifetime memory. And we got treated to these little surprises because when we first walked out onto the course, we saw Phil Mickelson at the height of his powers warming up on the chipping green. Of course, he's left-handed, and it was amazing. It was like computer-generated images because he would get, he'd get the ball, and he'd go back, and at first his chips would go past the hole, and it looked like he had a string, and he's pulling the ball toward the hole. It would go in or right by it. I mean, the accuracy was uncanny. And then he switched, and now his chips are going in front of the hole, but they're moving forward toward the hole, so it goes in the hole or, or right by it, and then he's doing the flops where he just goes up, and the ball comes up, and then it drops right by the hole, and Graham and I are just like, our jaws are dropping, and we can compare ourselves to each other. We compare ourselves to Phil Mickel. I mean, it's a joke. Who cares if we're within a few strokes of each other? Phil Mickelson plays an entirely different game. And so if you compare yourself to your neighbor, you, you just want to, you're a hacker, right? A three handicap per hole. And, and Jesus is saying, let me help you live a life where you shoot 59 on a regular basis. That's the dream life that Jesus calls us to. But that's the standard on which Catanoeto pulls us away from. Jesus is saying, don't live in toxic judgment, be a person of grace, saved by grace, who applies wise discernment, who seeks to bring healing, not hurt, who seeks to be a surgeon, not an assassin. Because see, a person of wise discernment and grace is enthralled, and I want you to get this, become enthralled with becoming like Christ. Think of Christ, the beauty of Christ, the wonder of Christ. Receive his affirmation. That's where you can focus. Or, well, at least I'm better than her. I'm a, I'm a little bit better. I mean, what, what's the dream life? Judging others or worshiping Jesus. And I think the reason it's so important for Shoreline, a lot of you may not realize how strategic this church is internationally. Some of the best teaching is going out on evangelism and sharing your faith, organic outreach and all of that. In fact, your pastor has been invited to go to Lausanne for that huge international conference they have any number of years to go with the top Christian minds in the world, literally. How do we reach this world for Christ? It's in the DNA of Shoreline to share your faith. Catanoeto will kill your ability to share your faith. Why? We win people over by being different in a positive sense, not a critical sense. We win people over by loving our spouses like others don't. We win people over by being gracious servants, 
not critical gossips. We win people over by being kind to our enemies in a way others can't even imagine because we focus on Jesus, we let Jesus transform us, and that's what draws people. Has judging your neighbor, your parents, your children, your spouse, your friend, your teacher, or people who wear masks while riding in their car alone, has that ever led one person closer to Jesus? It damages our witness. So Jesus says, don't go there. We have to focus on how we need to grow. That's what invites people in. So let's review real quickly. A person who lives in Catanoeto is the arrogant person who's negative. They're hoping to find something that's bad. They're uncharitable. They want to find a ceiling, he, sin rather than bring healing. They get a lustful pleasure out of discovering others' mistakes or failings. Wouldn't you rather get a holy pleasure out of being delivered from a sin? Or saying, I wouldn't have been that patient last year. I w- would have given myself over to anger. Or I was, I, I, I was wasting time, as Kevin talked about, but, but now I'm spending time. W- where do you want to get your pleasure? By growing or by where somebody else is failing? It puts the worst possible spin on someone else's motives, and it makes you a stranger to mercy. And so what does God say about Catanoeto? Don't, don't go there, it's a, just don't go there. This is Catanoeto, don't go to Catanoeto. Can we say that together? Don't go to Catanoeto. And if you see yourself doing it, because you don't want to say judge not, unless you be not judged, you'll be judging. Just say now, hey, don't go to Catanoeto. It should become a new phrase in our life. Instead of being a person, toxic judgment, be a person of wise discernment who receives grace, lives by grace, is enthralled with the beauty of Jesus and seeks to invite others into the growth that you're experiencing. That's the dream life. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for pointing this out. If it wasn't for your Sermon on the Mount, we never would have seen this. We wouldn't know how offensive it is to you and your Father. We wouldn't realize how destructive it is in our own souls. We wouldn't understand how it gets in the way of the mission you've called us to. Your words, Lord, are brilliant. But I thank you even more for the mercy that they represent. We don't have to compare with our sisters or brothers. We can receive your mercy and fall in love with mercy and give your mercy. Thank you for calling us into the dream life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, thanking Gary for opening God's word for us. Yeah. Well, after our service, in just a moment, we have what I think is one of the most bittersweet moments that we have at Shoreline Church. We're doing a sending time uh, under the pergola out there in the courtyard. My wife and I will be there with a few other pastors and leaders. And we want to, if you're leaving Shoreline in the next three months, we know some of our military folks are moving on. Some students that have been in the area are moving on. Some families are moving on. Part of Shoreline's life is that we say goodbye to people. And so we know that God's sending you somewhere else. And we, we bless that. But we also know we're going to miss you and we love you. So if you're leaving in the next three months, please don't just disappear. But come on by. We want to give you one of these coins uh, to take with you. And the the one side with the Shoreline logo is to remind you to pray for us. The other side with Acts 1-8 is to remind you that God's sending you somewhere to bring his love and to bring his light. And we pray and hope you go more equipped and more prepared to share the love of Jesus wherever you go next. Uh, And so if if that's you, please come and join us following the service. And we would love to spend a little time with you and give you actually a book to help you share your faith in the new place that you go. And we just pray over you. And Sherry and I want to pray with and bless each one of you before you go. Uh, If you're going to be around uh, today, for the football game on the Jumbotron. Uh, the weather's looking like kind of, kind of iffy, but we're hoping it's going to be beautiful out. It's kind of been nice most of the morning. Um, at 1.05, uh, come and join us. Bring your refreshments, bring your chairs. Uh, there'll hopefully be a bunch of people. If the weather gets bad, we're going to switch it over and move it into the Parkside room and keep on watching the game. And so if you want to watch the game today, be here at 1.05 to be a part of that, and it's going to be a great time together. If you need prayer, for anything in your life. If you're online and you need prayer, uh, just call the number you see right there on your screen and there's somebody waiting to pick up the phone and to pray with you. 
or you can email it to the email address you see, any prayer needs you have. And we have a whole prayer team that for the next couple of weeks will pray for you day by day and lift you up before the Lord. If you're on campus here and you want prayer, we're going to have teams on both sides of the stage, at the ends of the stage here. Please come on to the worship center or come to the front, and we would love to pray for you and pray with you. And then if you're new at Shoreline, if you're on campus and you're new, before you leave, just go right in the, in the lobby here to the Connection Center and just tell them, just say, I'm new. And they want to give you a little gift bag. Thank you for coming, answer your questions, and just get to know you a little bit and give you a warm personal welcome. If you're online and you're new with us, just text the word welcome to the, to the number you see right there, and we will reach out to you right away. And we would love to just give you a warm personal welcome online as best we can. If you're able to stand at home, online, or here in the worship center or on the campus, please stand with me for a closing word of blessing. As we close this time together, may the presence and the love and the grace of Jesus give you the confidence and peace to know that you don't have to judge everyone around you or anyone around you. But may you have wise biblical, godly discernment in all situations, shining and sharing the love of Jesus everywhere you go. Have a great week. God bless you, and we'll see you next Sunday.